Labor Day. This class gets cheated because we don't get a day off like everybody else does. We have a Tuesday, Thursday class and not a Monday, Wednesday class. So I'm a little disappointed. I thought we should have had an extra day to celebrate labor and relax, but that's not what the school thinks. So here we are. I did not get the video from Thursday put up. I'm doing that right now. Immediately after my second class on Thursday, I had to leave and go to New Mexico because it was the opening of grouse season. And so my father and my brother and I were on top of Elk Mountain all weekend hunting grouse, which are just absolutely the perfect thing for me to hunt because we've had a cabin in northern New Mexico for most of my life and we sold it recently, but we we'll still go up there to, to hunt. You, you almost never see a grouse. In my, in my 30 years of hunting grouse, I think I've seen 10, maybe, and so the odds of actually having to shoot something are, are de minimis. So I, I, it's the perfect thing to hunt for me because I would be a vegetarian, but for the fact that I get hungry, and then I need to eat something. But I prefer to think that the animal just sort of fell onto the plate, you know, like it died of natural causes and miraculously appeared on the plate. But I am an avid shooter, and so it is, uh, I'm not a hunter for the most part, but I am an avid shooter, and so I went with my dad, my brother. My dad is 83 this year, and so I don't know how many more years he's gonna be able to, to do this, because it's 11,000 feet where we camp. On, on the top of Elk Mountain, so that was a lot of fun. So I apologize for not, that's a long way of saying I didn't get the video up, but I will get it up if you weren't here on Thursday so that you can watch those videos of the sales presentations that we talked about and sort of went over the rubric and, and discussed those, and so you can see those if you weren't here or if you want to go back and review and sort of see what it is that you're going to be aiming for for the end of the semester. Today we need to talk about marketing history, since some of you have not had principles of marketing, some of you have not had me for principles of marketing, and so I start with this lecture on sort of marketing history and the history of sales. Now in the contemporary era, so I'm going to give you an opportunity to get some bonus points on your first, ex on your first exam here individually, if you can make a cogent argument as to whether or not we should engage in a review of the history of the discipline given the fact that there has been enormous changes in the way that we go about marketing and selling in a post-modern, post-industrial world. The way we think about things is completely different than even 10 or 15 years ago. So is a history of marketing and a history of sales important given the radical transformations that we've seen in a post-industrial, post-modern society. Who wants to take a shot at making a coaching argument? That it either is or is not important. Nobody? Yeah. I think it is important because that's where it all started from, the sales in general. Like we might have different techniques and our minds might think a little bit differently now, but it's still the same human interaction that we once had. Like face to face selling is still very as big as it was then and so we could still learn some tactics to use from back then that we thought to use now face for even though the mind kind of thinks differently. Okay, so your argument is that face to face selling is still important, even in an age of internet, even when we have Skype and FaceTime and we can hold virtual meetings and we don't necessarily have to be there uh, with the customer that it's still important. You were going to make an argument? What's your argument? Uh, I was just saying that I thought it was important also just because like each each time it's like being implemented back in like what they've learned from like each era like they wouldn't be able to like get to like the technology area without going to the like production area and like learning what you've learned Okay, so what your your argument is, and don't let me put words in your mouth if I'm not making your argument correctly, if I'm not restating it correctly, uh, go ahead and jump in. But I think what you're saying is that in the course of human history, although we are radically different than we were, say, 100 years ago, 
there is an incrementalism to the process in how we got here. Technology didn't just sort of spring like Venus from the phone out of nowhere. It was, it was a natural progression, and you see an incremental advancement in science. And so I think that's, I think that's a good argument, that there are incremental advances and I think your argument over there is, is a valid one. It's the one that I would make. I started out, I did not start out as a business professor. My academic career has been sort of all over the board. So I got a bachelor's and master's in political science. And I started teaching political science here at UCO when I was 22 years old. I never thought about being a business professor at all. And then I got my law degree and I became associate general counsel uh, for the university. And so then I started teaching law courses, and one day I was, most of our law courses were in the Department of Political Science, and one day they sort of shifted them all, and they ended up being in the College of Business, although there's still a pre-law uh, uh, degree over in the College of Liberal Arts. And then I went into industry as an executive vice president for a publicly traded company, and I realized that I didn't want to do that, and that's when I decided to go back and get a PhD in marketing. And through the, the sort of course of that, I, as a political scientist, studied a lot of history, and so I have a tendency to think history is important, where students in uh, business classes a lot of times say, well, it's not as important as maybe you think it is from a political science perspective, but I still think that history is important because, as you said, we didn't just get here all of a sudden, and sort of understanding how we got here is important. Understanding the fundamentals is still, in many respects, the same. Making a good argument is still fundamental to selling, and those techniques have not changed. Although the delivery method for them has changed, the techniques themselves have not. And so understanding that, I think, is important. And so I think an understanding of history, in spite of the fact that we have all of these things, the 50% the of the jobs that are in existence today in, in the United States will not be in existence in 10 years. Sales is one where it is still gonna be in existence in 10 years. And so you, ha you have to, to understand how it is that we got here. And so I think that history is very, very important in an understanding of sales and marketing. So what we talk about in marketing are these eras and in sales, these eras or philosophies of marketing. And because I started out as a liberal arts guy, and I make merciless fun of the college. I call it the land of hippie dippy over there. And if you go over there, there is a different feel. You know, the professors dress a little differently over there than we do in the College of Business generally. And the students look a little different over there. You, you find more of the hipsters over there than you do over here in the College of Business. And so it, it is a little bit different uh, culture over there, but it's one that uh, I was, you know, familiar with. And so I like philosophy unfortunately for you. And so I like talking about sort of the history of the marketing philosophies. And it begins with what we call the production era. For most of recorded history, until about 1920, we had a production philosophy. It was basically, if you built something, they will come. That's the takeaway from uh, the Field of Dreams movie. If you've seen that movie, it's a baseball movie, and he builds this field and, and a baseball uh, diamond out in this cornfield, and, and the players come. If you think about that, that made sense for most of human history, although it's hard to imagine in an era in which we have this device, which we call a cell phone or a smartphone, and it's really not much of a phone anymore, is it? I'm using it right now to control the camera at the back of the room, so I'm using it as a, a method of recording, and I can, by the way, I can switch it from recording on to the um, SD card back there to recording on my mobile device. And if I wanted to, I could go live on YouTube uh, and just broadcast it out there from, from this device. So this is really, we call it a smartphone, but it's really more smart than it is phone, because we don't, how many of you actually talk on the phone anymore? My generation loved to talk on the phone. Our parents liked to meet in person, because that was sort of the era in which they grew up. They didn't have, my mother, they had phones, but they were landlines. And by the way, when I was growing up in the 1990s, 
kids having their own landline was sort of a big deal. For a household to have two phones and the kids to have their own phone was, was a big deal. And then I remember I got my first cell phone when I was 16. It was a bag phone. It weighed like, I think, seven pounds. It was really heavy. It didn't work very well. You had to go to the top of the hill in Guthrie to get it to work at all. It worked sort of in Oklahoma City a little bit better. But the coverage wasn't great. And my generation actually liked to talk on the phone. We didn't like to meet in person because it's less likely that you are going to experience rejection over the phone. But your generation is even more removed from that than mine in that you really like text messaging. And one of the things that we know from psychological studies of you is the reason you like text messaging is because it's impersonal. And you have a horrible fear of rejection. Why is that? Well, part of it's cultural. We've been great. Everybody gets a trophy now. If you, if you show up and participate, you get, you get the medal. When you run the Oklahoma City Marathon, everybody gets a medal. When I was a kid growing up, only the top three that finished the Boston Marathon, that was the big marathon, got the medal. Now everybody gets a medal just for participating, right? And so you have this horrible fear of rejection that maybe we have imparted on you. And you like texting because it's even less likely that you'll experience rejection than you will over the phone. Over the phone, you can still tell by a person's tone and inflection whether or not they sort of agree with what you're saying. But texting, the written word is notoriously difficult to decipher in many instances, and it's ambiguous. As a result, your generation has come up with ways of attempting to insert your emotions into it, and we now have way more emoticons. I don't even know what some of the emoticons mean anymore, but we've attempted to deal with that by inserting emoticons into the text so that people know whether or not we're happy or sad or whatever. But you like the less impersonal. So it's hard to imagine, even 50 years ago, that people would put up with a lot less than they would put up with. But because there were fewer goods and services, if you go back to the founding of Oklahoma, it wasn't that, that long ago. It was just basically in the, in the scope of recorded history, a very, very short period of time. We were founded in 1889 in a land run when the unassigned lands were opened up for white settlement in Oklahoma. And the first land run occurred just north of Guthrie on April 22nd at high noon. They shot off a uh, a gun and people ran and they staked claims for land. We didn't become a state until 1907 and so our 100 year anniversary as a state was in 2007. That's not that many years ago. And so we're a fairly new society uh, and, but you know, we've experienced radical transformations. When I was going to college they didn't have wireless in the classrooms that you could connect to so that you could not pay attention to me and you could get on you know, Facebook or whatever it is that you're getting on, Instagram, what's the latest social? You all have started banning Facebook, by the way, is what I'm told. Why is that? Why is it that you're, you're abandoning Facebook? How many of you still have a Facebook account? Do you check it every day? How many of you can check it every day? Only a few of you check it every day. What's the big social? Why is it that you're abandoning Facebook? It's seen as a social media site for like the older generation. Yeah, it's not yeah. odd. It's the older. It's we view it as as being our parents. And once your parents start creeping on it, it's not cool anymore. It's it's lost some of its panache. Although we do know your generation, unlike other generations before you really like your parents more than previous generations. You view your parents as friends, but there's still some things that you don't want your parents to see. So yeah, Facebook is viewed as being for older people. This is all very different than if you go back to 1907, where if you had a, a, a black Model T, it would sell, because it was so much better than what was out there before. If you, if you didn't want to you know, ride in a car back in 1907, what was the option? Well, it was a horse. That's not, that's not a great mode of transportation. If you want to get anywhere very fast. Why do we have 77 counties in Oklahoma? Anybody know from Oklahoma history? You should remember this from, how many of you grew up in Oklahoma and went to school, high school in Oklahoma, and had to take Oklahoma history? Why do we have 77 counties? 
We have a lot of counties, don't we? New Mexico is the fifth largest state in terms of land area where I was born, the state that I was born and where I went to go grouse hunting. They have half the number of counties, and they're a much bigger state in terms of geographic size. Why is it that we have 77 counties? Is that the amount of land runs? The what? The amount of land runs. The amount of land runs? That's a good guess. It was because they didn't want it to be more than half a day's ride into the county seat so you could conduct county business. Where did you have to go if you wanted to file deeds and papers and things like that? Well, you go to the county clerk's office, and that's in the county seat. So in, in my home county, in Logan County, it's Guthrie, we're the county seat. And you could get anywhere in the county within half a day's ride. So you could do what, in theory? Well, you could ride your horse to the county seat, you could file your paperwork, and you could get back to the farm in one day. And that's the reason that we have 77 counties. That's incredible to believe. And yet, there are people who still are alive that can remember when it was difficult to get to the county seat. And so, if you had this Model T, it was much better than the horse, and so you'd accept that. And so, for most of human history, if you, if you had anything to offer for sale, people would buy it because it was better than the alternative. Products weren't highly differentiated the way they are today. Now, everything is differentiated. This phone is radically different than you know other phones that are on the market. You can get everything from very basic, you know, sort of cellular and minimal amounts of texting and data for people who don't use a lot of that to phones that are more smart than this. Apple is about to release. They had the big iPhone 10. That was a big deal for about a year and a half. Every year and a half, two years, they release a new Apple product and they're about to release their new iPhones, and we'll see what comes out. Samsung will do the same thing. They'll follow, and there's this radical differentiation between these devices. What makes an Apple different from a Samsung? Well, off the top of your head, it doesn't seem that different. They both involve texting. They both can be used to do what? Send pictures, get on the internet. What makes a Samsung different? What features does the Samsung have? For those of you who have a Droid or uh, other device. What difference is it from the iOS? What makes it different? Operating system. The operating system. But what about that? So that's a that's a feature. What's the benefit of the iOS that's different than a Droid, for example? Like with the Android, you can personalize it a little bit more. Okay. More the iOS is more locked down, which means what? What's one of the features that user friendly? Yeah, the, uh, the iOS is maybe more user-friendly. It also is less susceptible to uh, viruses and things like that because Apple really locks down their system. It's what I'm told by people who are really techy. What can you do with an iPhone that you can't do with a Droid? And it's the reason that a lot of people still have the, the Face iPhone. FaceTime? FaceTime. For a lot of people, that's a huge thing, particularly for people who want to watch their grandkids. I think I told you all my mother realized that she was virtually babysitting at one point in time because my brother called when he was living in Saratoga Springs, New York, and said, the kids want to talk to you, Mom, and they're on FaceTime. And all of a sudden, she realized, you know, they're putting Granny in the pot, and they're running around the house. And she said, where are your parents? Oh, they're out back with their friends having dinner. She was babysitting by, you know, by iPhone and FaceTime thousands of miles away. And so there's these, these radical differences, but that was not the case for most of recorded history. So um, it was a lot of things were done in barter. If you had if you had cattle, you might sell milk and trade it for eggs, things like that. It was very simplistic. And now we've got a lot more differentiation in the market. So if you build it, they will come. In 1920 we get the sales era. And this is the one and this is the one that I think is really important for salespeople to understand. And in this class, what we'll focus in a lot on is what it is about the sales era. Because for a lot of people, if you say salesman, they have a very pejorative attitude or opinion about the selling profession. And we have a lot of students that say things when they come into college as freshmen and we go talk to them. They say, you know, what do you, what do you want to get a degree? Well, they want to get a, they know they want to get a business degree, and why do they want to get a business degree? Because maybe their parents said things like, when you said, I'm going to go get a degree in musical theater. No, 
No, no, no you're not. <laughs> you know, that, that degree is about as useful, if anybody's a musical theater major in here, I'm sorry to tell you, that degree is about as useful as, you know, working at uh, the Dairy Queen and making tasty freezes. <laughs> you can get it. We have a very fine musical theater department. And all these people go over there and they learn how to flop around <laughs> on stage. And then they're, you know, would you like fries with that? That's what they're doing. If they're really, you know, good, I guess they could be a barista at Starbucks. <laughs> Hate to tell you, you know, you're not going to be a star. Very few people are. You know, there's a lot of luck in that, but a lot of people know if I get a business degree, I'll get a job. But they say, God, I don't want to be a salesperson. <coughs> what is that? Well, it largely comes from this era that we have this attitude about salespeople. It begins in 1920 and goes to about 1960. And the focus in that time period was you make a pitch, it's the ADA model awareness, interest, desire, action. And so we had this sort of model where you get their interest up here, you make a pitch, and then you spend all your time closing, long and hard. And you get the sale and you move on to the next sale. We now spend more time, we've inverted the pyramid in the sales process, and I'll give you a better slide, and we spend a lot more time on gathering information on our clients and figuring out what it is that they want. Rather than just making a pitch, this is what we call, this era of sales is what we call the transactional sales period. That's a test question, you should know that. The transactional sales period. Now, we still see these attitudes and these philosophies being used. If you think that nobody uses the production era, there are still lots of companies that use the production era, even, or the production philosophy, even high-tech companies. Microsoft is infamous for releasing really crappy operating systems, foisting it off on us, and we accept it. Why? Because they control 80% of the market. Most of you, the vast majority of you, have a Windows operating device. Why? They're just the biggest. What's their, what's their next biggest competitor? Was, was was Windows, was Microsoft's products ever really good? At the beginning? No, they weren't. It was, they were horrible. This guy who, you know, ate Cheetos like they were going out of style, bought what was called, he didn't even invent it. Bill Gates bought and started marketing an operating system which was called QDOS, <coughs> which stood for Quick and Dirty Operating System originally. And then they changed it. They decided that wasn't such a good marketing name. But they bought QDOS and then they made it into DOS, Digital Operating System. And from that was born Windows. And how many versions of Windows have been just wonderful? I'm going to date myself now. Windows Vista. That was horrible. They had this big hype about Vista, and it was a, it's a horrible operating system. There was a better operating system out there at one time, but nobody knew who owned it, really. It was called Linux. Some people still run Linux, by the way. There are still school systems that use Linux. The company that I worked for, we had to make sure our, our, our learning management system would actually operate on Linux, because a lot of prisons, we sold to a lot of prisons, they actually still use Linux. And it was actually a better operating system. So, you know, Microsoft releases crappy products and they fix them on the back end. But they've got a production mentality. There's not a lot of op there's not a lot of, of options in that space. You basically have Windows or what? You run Linux. You can still have iOS. That's it. got a laptop, 
desktop, most of them are going to run off of what? Windows. Unless you have a Mac. So they still have this production error. Apple under Steve Jobs was absolutely a production philosophy driven company. Steve Jobs' attitude was you, they did no market research. You don't know what you want. You don't know what's cool. I'm Steve Jobs. I'm the arbiter of what's cool and hip, and I will tell you what it is, and you will buy it. And we did. We did. Now they're losing market share, and Steve is dead. When Steve was alive, he said that they would never make an iPad Mini because you had to have enough, you had to have enough real property there to be able to enjoy the benefits and so But when he died, all of a sudden they came out with what? The iPad Mini, because marketing research showed they were having they were having stiff competition from other uh, device manufacturers that were making them smaller and easier to use for things like if you're traveling on a plane. But we still see this production era being used even by big companies like Apple, like Microsoft, that are still using that lack of marketing knowledge. They, they don't care to engage in market research. They're going to tell you. They're going to put the, the product out there. And by and large, we, we have bought into Apple. They are still the largest cell phone distributor and market share today in the United States. So that, that's an example of production era. The sales era, we still see this. Where do we see this kind of high pressure sales tactics that are the reason that we have this pejorative attitude about selling? You see it if you go to Mathis Brothers. It's a horrific experience. You see it used on car lots still. And my favorite fall event, this is usually a test question, is coming up. It's the Oklahoma State Fair. I love the fair. I get a season pass to the fair. It's great. You should go to the fair. As marketers and salespeople, you should go. One year I said this, and there was three stabbings at the fair that year, and my students came back and said, don't you like us? People were killed. Well, you've got to avoid that. Don't, you know, don't get stabbed, but you should go to the fair. As marketers, it's, it's, a, it's a rich <coughs> marketing experience. It's amazing to me as a marketer to see what people would rather have than their own money. <laughs> it's incredible. They sell everything at the fair. Everything that you don't need. And it's all transactional sales. It's this era. It's these guys in the, in the various buildings, the uh, Maiden Oklahoma building, and the uh, Centennial building, and the Modern America building, and the auto uh, sales building. You'll see these people with these microphones, like their Cher or Madonna or something up there, you know, making a pitch, getting your interest, making you aware, awareness, interest, desire, action. Selling everything from Ginsu knives to the sham wow. And once they make the sale, what happens at, at, at the end of 10 days? The fair is 10 days. When I was growing up as a kid, the fair was a month. I loved it. That was great. You know, what happens at the end of 10 days when the fair is over? Maybe 11 days. They go on to the next fair, don't they? They pack up their stuff. And they go to the Texas State Fair. Wait, is it all one fair? What? Yeah. Like they just travel around like the whole United States? Well, it's different fairs. Different states have different. And some states have more than one. The, the big state fair in Texas is actually in Dallas. But Dallas is not the capital. They actually have, an, they have a Texas State Fair in Austin. And so they have a huge, they have a big state fair, I think, in Houston as well. And so these people, you know, the state fair started. What, what's the big thing in the political arena? Well, it's the Iowa State Fair, which started a couple weeks ago, actually. Why do they start the State Fair in Iowa before we start it in Oklahoma? It's colder. It gets colder further or faster. You have harvest, and so that was the time that you had the State Fair. So go to the, go to the State Fair, walk around, look at all the stuff that you can buy, and it's this transactional thing. Watch the models. They're going to do a little demonstration, a little product demonstration, get you to, to buy it. And 
uh, and they aren't going to engage in a whole lot of customer service. Billy Mays was famous for this. Billy advertised all kinds of stuff. Billy's dead now. You all probably don't even remember Billy Mays. What was Billy Mays' uh, You know, he had all of these products that were supposed to be just miraculous. And none of them lived up to the hype, except for two that I can think of that really lived up to the hype. One was OxyClean. It really, now, it's not as wonderful as Billy said it was. Billy would be out there, you know, with the kid that's got the bloody knee or something like that. No, you just spray a little OxyClean on it, and it just takes the blood. It won't do that, I will tell you that. But it will take grass out, and it will take a lot of stuff out. It's a pretty good product. The other one that he really advertised that, that did work as well as he said it was were these things called Hercules hooks. You can still buy them at Bed Bath & Beyond. But rather than putting a nail into drywall and having your pictures fall out, it actually goes into the drywall and hooks up, and you can hang up to 200 pounds on it. And it really was about as wonderful. And Billy said there was a money-back guarantee on all this stuff. So one of the things that he, he sold that was the last one of the last products that he, he brought to market before he died was the stuff called Orange Glow. I had hardwood floors throughout my home. And if you have hardwood floors, you know that they're kind of tricky, to, particularly older hardwood floors. You have to put a, a, a coat, a protective coat of um, polyurethane on them or marine varnish works really well. But they get scratched up from furniture moving around and people walking on them and things like that with dirt. And he made this, there, he came up with this stuff called Orange Glow, which you were supposed to be able to spray on the floor, and it would just totally remove all of the scratches from a hardwood floor. And it didn't work. And it had a money-back guarantee, but I bought it, and did I send it back? No. Why? It's cheap. The risk is very low, and so what are the odds of anybody actually sending it back? It smelled pretty good, but it didn't work quite as well. But these, these sort of negative attitudes we have towards salespeople stem from this era. And go to the fair and watch it, and you'll see. Because all of these products that are supposed to be as wonderful, they have like stainless steel pots that are supposed to never uh, burn. Well, they will once you get them home. They'll do a demonstration there. If you the first time you use a stainless steel pot, it generally won't uh, burn. But after that, if you're not careful and you don't know how to do it, they will. They're horrible, in my opinion. And so you know you'll get it home and you'll probably be disappointed. And then you'll curse that salesperson. And that's that's what happened in this era, was we just moved on. We mass produced a lot of stuff, and we built it in sort of three sizes, small, medium, and large. And we just foisted it off on people, not realizing that there really was a need to engage in more customer service and sale service after the sale, which we talked a lot about in this class. So, I have a critical thinking challenge for you to get in your groups, and there will be a drop box for you to, to put this in. I'm going to give you about 15 minutes to come up with an answer to these questions in your, in your groups and make a cogent argument as to is marketing and sales as a subfield of the marketing discipline, are they an art or a science? And you should justify your answer with three examples. There's something nice. I want you to get used to thinking about things in three. People can remember three things in sales. It's called the triumvirate ring. So three examples. That's the way academics write. You're going to tell me what you're going to tell me with an introduction, right? You're going to tell me what you're going to say with your three examples, and then you're going to do what? What's your conclusion? Tell me what you said. That's the way academics write. And that's the way people remember things. Redundancy is good. Three things. Tell them, show them, tell them what you said. So come up with three examples to justify whether or not marketing is an art or a science. Is everything that we teach on a college campus an art or a science? Or is there something else? And what is the difference between art and science? So get in your groups. There will be a drop box. I'll stop the camera for a few minutes. I will give you until, let's say, 10, 25. Come up with your answers. You can put them in the Dropbox after class so you don't get any on your computer today. Um, you have until midnight to put those in the Dropbox, and I'll show you where those are in just a second. But I'm going to stop the camera now, and I will pull up the uh, learning management system. So it is like experience. All right. So for today's presentation order, we'll go back there, and here, and here, and here. So we'll make a circle team. Like this. So we'll start with the back group back there. 
answer. Come on up and tell me your answer. Let's see what you have. Let's see what you all came up with. <laughs> All right, so we determined that uh, selling should be considered an art because it should be personalized to get the needs of each and every pers prospective buyer. The second explanation to support art being a major factor in sales can be explained by the fact that art continue to, continues to change over time and adapts to many different styles for a unique approach to the buyer. The third relation between art and selling comes in the form of the seller meeting a natural talent that he or she fine-tunes to meet the buyer's needs. Okay. That's what we got. Uh, the second question was about science and art. Mm -hmm. uh, we kind of believe that it's both. And just the easiest explanation I can think of the top of my head is, I mean, we teach both in schools. Okay. So how could it not be both? Okay, so you think that... We didn't really like, go over that when we were still working on the first kind of takes. If we teach both of them, then it's obviously incorporated in the, what we learned, so we have to incorporate it. Okay. All right. So... You think that everything's either an art or a science, or it's a combination of both? Definitely a combination. A combination of two. But so selling, I believe that we believe as a group that art is definitely. It's more of an art than a science. Yeah, but okay. in schools, yeah, it's a combination. What's the difference between art and science? There's no proofs of art. Yeah. Science, there's yeah. formulas, and you can go off of it and get the answers every time. And kind of like we said, art, you have to be able to adapt. And like the best explanation for that is, or I guess comparison is like in art, you see different styles over time. The greatest artist, and it changes, and people keep adapting to it, and that's how kind of selling it. Okay. So art is more. I guess what you're saying by by. And again, don't let me make an argument that you're not making if I'm not getting this correct. But I think what you're saying is that art is more subjective. Yes. And so by saying it's adjustable, it's science more. Is objective. Objective. Yeah, and science is objective. Right. And science is based on the ability to prove or disprove stuff. Of course, Karl Popper argues that the only real science is the science of reputation, that you. you Really, you never know anything for certain. You can only know something is is you know not true. So, for example, um, Popper would say if we start out with a, a, a hypothesis, all cows eat grass. Well, you know we start looking at cows, and as soon as we find a cow that doesn't eat grass, that all it will eat is beans. You know we disproved. No, I don't know that that's true, but uh, you know, I, I think a lot of scientists disagree with that idea that we can't. But you never know anything for absolute certainty. That's why we say they're hypotheses or they're theories in science. But it is more concrete. Right. We, have, we don't say it's absolute fact that the Big Bang occurred, but it's pretty well established in science that that's the beginnings of the origins of the universe. Right? Okay. All right, very good. Good deal. Good job. You have until tonight to post, uh, to post it to the Dropbox. <laughs> Second grade. <laughs> yeah, that's what, that's what I thought you were going to say. I was going to say that. <laughs> Um, we view selling more as a science. Um, we uh, there are proven method proven methods of selling certain services or products that have been tested uh, through trial and error to work. And human science has played a huge, uh, large role. Research and gaining knowledge prior to a pitch is like very important. Okay, sales world. 
Um, we kind of didn't think of the third example for the first one, but so two, you've got proven methods. Good communication is good communication. If you muddle things, we kind of combined two different examples, but in one. Okay. So nice. went hand in hand. Okay. Yeah, okay. Third right. example on that first question, we can like really talk about interpersonal relationships because that's more of a social science. Okay. So I mean that can really lean towards more science. Okay. That, and I mean psychology is a science and human relationships involve psychological aspects, and so I'll buy that argument. Um, on the college campuses, we aim for the college campuses to teach everything more as a science. They have more structure in classes than even, like, when you think of a college campus, you think of the aesthetic, like, value. Mm -hmm. A lot of people say that they fall in love with the campus when it comes to, like, building choice, like, maybe, it's, like, OSU has a really good example with their library and the Orange Fountain. And so, for us, like, that's, like, place there to be, like, a science, like, people see it as, like, oh, wow, like, this place is, like, really pretty, like, I'd want to go here, you know. Maybe not for such uh, social reasons. But okay. No, I, I think that's right. I mean, there's a reason that people are attracted. There, uh, you know, there are there are studies that are done on what are the big party schools. I will tell you that one of the big party schools every year of the study is OSU. It's OSU. What's well, one of the least party schools in the in the nation? Anybody want to guess? Maybe. I don't know. BYU. How did you get? How did you? Yeah. Why do you think BYU is? Not they, a party school. They just seem really lame. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's a it's a Mormon school, so yeah, that's that's all the crazy. It's one of the least Sorry, party party schools. <laughs> so yeah, there's you know there's certainly a, an aesthetic to things that you wanted people to be attracted, and um, one of the reasons that we've redone the business building, even though this is an older building, this is a lot more attractive. It's a lot better learning environment than it used to be. This room was stark white. There was no rub rail, there was no carpet in here, and we had chalkboards. It was just kind of, you know, a, an ugly building with, and those walls were all, they re-plastered over them. They were just the old cinder block kind of construction, and it was really kind of hideous. It was, it was dreadful to come into these classrooms, and so we've done this to make it a better environment. It's also, the hallways, until they put the carpeting upstairs, this one is still pretty loud because they don't have the carpeting up there, but that's science. We know that by putting the carpeting in the hallway, what has it done in terms of the noise level out there and the, you know, what, it, what impacts the learning environment in here is that it's quieter. So yeah, I think that's, that is all, I mean, that's science, okay? And the third question, we said that art was based on creativity and science is more based on fact. Okay, art is creative. Um, science is based in fact. Can science be creative? Yeah. Okay. The way you can think about things, I think, the way you approach a problem involves creative problem solving and that can be science. Okay. All right. Very good. Good job. Yes, sir. So the answer to the first question that we got is you have to study. We believe that it is a science because you have to study the customers' wants and needs. You have to determine like what color, shapes, texture is pleasing to humans. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, um, the second part of it, uh, we did that. It's um, the, one of the other reasons is that it's uh, study more diverse environments and engage in uh, like various cultural like competencies, things like that. And then third one. I can write these back. So. Um. Yeah. Uh, science is objective and art is subjective. Okay, that's that's the correct answer. That's the technical terms for it. Science is objective and art is subjective. Although what we're finding out is that as we go along and we study aesthetics, what we think of as being beautiful is really not all that subjective. It tends to be very objective. What people will uh, view as being a classical beauty face is very, very objective. And so in philosophy, in the aesthetics realm, they're actually now beginning to do empirical studies based on, and I think I told you all this, they, they show babies pictures and watch what the reaction is of children. Children are very honest. 
and they'll sit there and they will look at Denzel Washington far longer than they'll look at Lyle Lovett or somebody who's got an asymmetrical face. When we ask artists from around the world to paint ideal scenes, they all have a tendency to paint the same kinds of scenes with the same proportions of the, you know, it's, it's, always a, it's always, almost always a pastoral scene, a bucolic scene, and there's a water feature, and it's got sort of the same proportions of the sky to, uh, you know, the horizon to land, and, and it's, it's very um, balanced in terms of those things. So we're finding out that what we think of as being beautiful may not be as subjective as we think. But that is the classic answer, is that art is subjective, what you view as being art is, is subjective. Some people think that Elvis, when I was growing up, the, the state fair, you could find these people that painted paintings on black velvet. Elvis on black velvet was a, was a you know, big one that you could find in the state fair. I don't consider that art, but you know, other people do. And so it is more uh, in, the, in the opinion of the individual. So that's sort of the classic uh, answer. Very good. Good job on that one. What about the third one? The third one is what's the difference between, oh, okay. Is everything, I'm sorry, the second one is the one that uh, didn't answer. Is everything either an art or a science on a college campus? Uh, we decided that everything on a college campus is a science because it's a system of okay. okay. acquiring knowledge. Okay. Even, even musical theater is a science. You think so? Really? You go over to the land of flopping around over there, <laughs> and they're dancing and singing. They have to learn like where dances and stuff originate, and like the culture of dance for specific dances. So hip hop compared to classical, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. All right. I think that's. I think that is true. I mean, there is there is a reason that you study it, and you can study it in a systematic way, and that is somewhat scientific, even in something as, as subjective as maybe musical theater. There is a way that you go about performing. They, they, they know how to teach music. There's theory in music and how you go about learning it. I wanted to be a country and western superstar, and I'm a tone deaf flat baritone, so I had to become a college professor instead. But I went to this woman and I wanted to learn to sing one song really well in karaoke, because I love karaoke. If you go back through my YouTube channel, you can find you know, examples of these things very, my friends hate it. And you know, she said, no, you have to learn theory and stuff like that. So she starts playing and I couldn't sing to anything. And she says, you're a tone deaf, flat baritone. Maybe if after years of working with you, I could get you to sing one song really well. Like here, he he him, but thought, well, that's what I said I wanted to do. And you're the one who said I had to do all this theory. But there is this idea that you have to learn sort of the basics. You have to learn to read music and, and understand you know, the rhythm and the tempo and the harmony and be able to hear that. And so there's a way you go about doing that. And that is, I guess, the science. We're about out of time, so we will finish with this. Um, next time, which means I'll actually give you until the end of Thursday. You don't have to put it in today, today so we can get to all of them. I'll give you until Thursday at midnight to turn those into the drop box in your group. So I left off, I will write it down. I passed a roll sheet, didn't I? No, I didn't pass the rule. No, I sure didn't. Uh, sign it on your way out. Since you've got a few minutes, I'm letting you go. Four minutes early, you have time to sign the rule sheet. And I would do it. Well, I'll type it up tonight. Right. Uh, we have some pretty good answers. We'll probably have to do it. Yeah, Good presentation, guys. Yeah, for real. Yeah. 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 Yeah.